I would like to invite on stage uh, Megan Sapp, Philip Pirker. Where are you? Are oh, you not there? Oh, you're here. Come. And online, we'll have Rylan and Josh and Rebecca Tickel, the director of the movie. There's no mic, but that's okay because we're going to start with our friends online. I hope you liked the film. I should have come with the mic. Sorry. Hello. Welcome. How are you? We do not hear you. Nice hat, by the way. <laughs> we do not hear you. Yeah, do you hear us? Yeah. I hear you. Ah, cool. Welcome. So this is the uh, Paris audience for your, the European premiere of uh, Common Ground. Congratulations. How do you feel about uh, being screened in, in Europe? I, I can hear people in the... Uh, speaking in my headset. But you do not hear me. No, I do, hear, I do hear you, but I also hear people speaking in the headset. Mm, I'm sorry for these technical things. Maybe we could uh, resolve this. Je vais faire deux micros. Um, so maybe we're going to start with our uh, with you, uh, Megan and uh, uh, Philip, who are here. Um, you are two um, player on the field of regenerative agriculture. So I would really, really like to understand. Maybe starting with you, I understand that your personal journey was really impacted by Kiss the Ground, the first film of uh, Josh. Well, the first film on. Uh, agriculture uh, by Josh and Rebecca. Can you tell us your journey to to this and what you do exactly now uh, to help in this um, big revolution? Sure, pleasure to be here. Um, always good to be at Chech now. My name is Philip. Um, you probably hear the accent. I'm German-born originally. I live in Portugal now. Um, in 2017, me and a few friends bought a few hectares of land and an abandoned village in the Portuguese mountains. And that's when my own personal journey into regenerative agriculture started. Um, initially back then by visiting about 60 farmers across Western Europe, um, which were the only farmers that I could find that were practicing Regen Act back then. And basically working and staying with them and trying to understand how is it possible that regenerative agriculture is such an obvious solution to so many of our issues. And it's nothing new, by the way. There's papers from Wageningen University from the 80s and 90s already talking about carbon sequestration and biodiversity increase through regenerative agriculture and its indigenous practices, as we heard in the movie. But it was nothing that was being talked about back then. And um, then we started Climate Farmers in 2019 in order to connect many of the European farmers in Europe which were trying to make their first steps into regenerative agriculture but were not connected with each other. We also started organizing trainings and coachings and um, around the same time as this was all slowly kicking off, Kiss the Ground came out in 2020. And it was crazy because suddenly from maybe one in a hundred people having heard about Region Ag, we went to 10, 20 people having heard about regenerative agriculture. So I was very honored to be here tonight because I could really feel the impact that the movie had, especially also in Europe, on the movement and on bringing awareness towards the common people about regenerative agriculture because Let's face it, Netflix is what almost everybody has, and this is where you reach the people, essentially. And uh, according to you, in your according to you, sorry, in Europe, um, what would be the biggest obstacle to this, um, to the fact that we should adopt, everybody should adopt this kind of agriculture? What is, what are the main obstacles after watching the movie? Yeah. Um, what is specific to our um, uh, area if, if there anything specific at all? I mean, I think Europe and America face very similar challenges there. Like, um, if I had a magic wand, I would establish true cost accounting and we would suddenly have regenerative agriculture everywhere. 
I think the big issue that we're having is that farmers only get paid for yield. They don't get paid for ecosystem here. services. They don't get paid for building up biodiversity. We're starting to see a voluntary carbon market or on carbon sequestration no, developing, okay. but it's still not enough to actually financially compensate farmers. And I think that's the big issue that we're having, right? And I really love that now in the second movie, we're also really calling out the agrochemical industry because I think that is a big issue that we're having, the power that the agrochemical industry is having and that they're using in order to influence also on the political level. And that's also why one of the things that I'm really happy and that we kickstarted with Climate Farmers is EARA. And that brings us to Megan, who's also sitting here, which is the European Alliance for Regenerative Agriculture, which is an organization by farmers for farmers lobbying for regenerative agriculture. And I think what we need is we need to have the education. We need universities to start teaching about regenerative agriculture. We need to start paying for ecosystem services as society, not just as a private sector. And we need the political uh, direction to go there as well. And we need payment and subsidies coming from the common agricultural policy to go for ecosystem services. So, so your um, very action is climate farmers. So t tell us more how it uh, bridges some gaps in this uh, trend. Sure. So on the one hand, what we're doing is we're, we're connecting farmers together. So we're organizing events online and offline. Um, where we basically host trainings for farmers that want to learn about regenerative agriculture. We also have basically very basic WhatsApp groups. We tried fancy things like Mighty Networks and so on. In the end, WhatsApp groups work best. And we have Paola here as well, who's managing our community of farmers here in Europe. Um, and then we also measure ecosystem services of farmers. We enable them to get paid for that through carbon and biodiversity credits. And we are also working on a verification for regenerative agriculture. Miguel, welcome on stage. Um, can you tell us more about what you do uh, specifically uh, regarding this trend also? Sure, thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, so as you can tell from my accent, I'm American and I live in Spain. So you've got the German and Portugal and the American in Spain. Um, but uh, so about 10 years ago, my husband and I bought a, a very degraded farm uh, in the north of Spain between Pamplona and San Sebastian with the idea of building an off-grid home where we would produce all of our own energy and demonstrate uh, sustainable modern living. Um, about six years ago, while I was trying to finish up my university degree 20-something years late, I found uh, holistic management um, by accident through my university in the US. Um, and I fell completely uh, head in, uh, head first into this, uh, drank the Kool-Aid, as we like to say. Um, and my husband and I, we implemented uh, holistic management. Uh, in the first year, we were able to reduce the maintenance costs for our horses uh, by 80%. And what we saw was, as we like to say in holistic management, this shit works. Um, why do we say that? Because we're all about integrating uh, livestock into um, our production systems where we are cycling nutrients as quickly as possible, and that's how we do it. So, um, so I got into this. Uh, it brought together 20 years of work of my professional career uh, around Africa and Europe in sustainable agriculture. Um, my holistic management gave me a framework, gave me a language, gave me understanding of how nature works. Uh, and how what we do affects uh, not only ourselves and our land, but also our communities. And uh, I trained and trained and trained, and then uh, got together with uh, colleagues like I have today in the audience, um, as well as others. And we founded what's known as uh, an accredited hub by the Savory Institute. So um, we're a global network of 50 hubs around the world that take this uh, universal knowledge that we know of as holistic management and we bring it into the local context. So where we are in northern Spain, um, I spend most of my time, ooh, I spend most of my time uh, traveling around and uh, teaching farmers um, how to uh, apply holistic management, understand how what they do is in uh, relationship with um, with the land and, and how to uh, regrow, uh, regenerate their, their local communities. Um, so we provide uh, farmer training uh, in Spain. In the next three weeks, we're gonna be kicking off uh, our first training in France, which is super exciting. We do advisory for farmers, for companies, and we're basically trying to um, grow this movement as quickly as possible. 
what, both of you, what do you feel you are fighting? Do you fight culture? Do you fight a system? Do you fight indifference? What is it that you're fighting? We find mindsets, mind mentality, mindsets, but we mostly fight fear. Fear of change, fear of failure, fear of being the, the weird guy who's doing things differently, um, fear of running out of money, fear of losing the farm, fear of just about any kind of, but we find this in systems change in, in anything, right? But we're dealing with um, agriculture, we're dealing with an aging population where they're just trying to get to the end of their lives and everything we find, but we're trying to focus more on that generational transition. How can we make agriculture economically uh, viable so we can be attracting the younger generations back to the land? Like we saw in the film, many of these young farmers, we ourselves are first generation farmers. Uh, how can we be getting people, because if we don't have people on the land producing food, we're really, in pro <laughs> we're really in trouble. So you fight culture? Yeah. Okay. I, un I understand that we have the whole production and uh, directing team now on stage. Oh, I can look at the air, no? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> This is better. It's very, very, very weird for me. Um, so welcome. Uh, thank you for your wonderful film. Um, I'm really, really uh, interested. I know you are working. You have been working on several films together. Why this sequel? Why, after *Kiss the Ground*, did you feel the need to do another film on that very topic? And I don't know, do not know who wants to go first. Well. You know, uh, during the process, these are these are like my two husbands here. <laughs> a decade of um, making films about dirt, you know, together, and uh, you end up becoming family through the process. But also during the ten years that we've been making these films, um, Josh and I had two children. We became parents, and so did Ryland. And we realized that our lives were getting extended hundreds of years into the future in that moment, and so it really made the urgency of us as storytellers and having this tool that can reach the world, that can reach the mainstream with ideas through storytelling, made the urgency of us telling the story and telling it well and pulling back the curtain and showing what's holding us back from making this transition. There was no choice to not make these films, ever. Ryland came to us and he's like, you've got to stop making movies about oil. You've got to start making movies about soil. We were like, ah, there's nothing harder to make movies about than dirt. You know, you've heard the expression, dull as dirt. It's not exactly huge in Hollywood. So um, we just had to find a way to take this message, take the information, take the knowledge, take the wisdom, and put it into an entertaining story that could reach the mainstream and kiss the ground. It just didn't go as far as we needed it to. We really needed to take this a step further and show how the corruption of the profit of these companies has influenced the science and the policies that are affecting us and how it can change that. Yeah, I'll just add to that that what we found with this particular subject for generation, and I think many of you are in the same boat, it's great to hear a story of people who are doing this, the Savory Hub that you all have established, that's fantastic. This work is almost fractal. The more you begin to learn about regeneration, the more you realize how little we know and how vast a field this is. It's vast in terms of history and ancient history, prehistory. It's vast in terms of biology. And it's potentially vast even on a, an ethereal level or a spiritual level, which I think Rudolf Steiner and many people who have studied this over the ages, they get to a point where, you know, Gaia theory or deep green ecology goes so deeply that you begin to really build connections between what our purpose is on this plane or this planet and the future, as Rebecca mentioned, future life, children, but all life forms. I mean, the simple answer as to why a second film and now there's a third film 
in the works that we're all working on uh, is we didn't solve the problem. Oh, you got is excited that about that. <laughs> did yes, uh, the did third Mick Jagger just coming. show up? Or wow. <laughs> was that the third film? Uh, the, the simple answer to the question is why another or two more films is we haven't solved the problem yet. Yeah, but climate change is this existential crisis, but it's this. We, we have yet to frame it as a species, as an understanding of the massive opportunity that exists. Because so far we've just talked about the opportunity to build solar panels and wind turbines and electric cars, which is ultimately more capitalism. It's great, it makes people money, it's jobs, green economy, yeah, sure. But it doesn't essentially provide a new paradigm. And what I think you all are bumping up against in the conference and change now and what we're bumping up against at the end of Common Ground, at the end of the second film as we begin the journey of the third film, is a new philosophical paradigm for our species. So you are not going to do a, another sequel on uh, regenerative agriculture, but you're going to go on the wisdom of what you are learning, doing what you do, is that correct? It's all of the above. <laughs> all of the above, I love that. But uh, I'm also a filmmaker, so I'm really, really interested in the way you work, um, considering uh, I love the way you, you, you frame what you do. You said you are audience-supported, non-profit promoting regenerative agriculture. This film is a tool for something else. Um, what did you learn in the first impact campaign uh, to do this one? Um, do you have specific goal for this film in terms of impact? Um, and how would you measure it? With Kiss the Ground, it reached 39 million American school kids. It went into over 30 languages around the world, shown in countries around the world. It really was, um, in all of the impact that we've seen, the transition in the United States from about 3 million acres in regeneration to over 30 million acres in regeneration, just since the time that Kiss the Ground came out. Um, we're seeing policy and money, and everything is being affected in some way or another by this conversation about regeneration, which Kiss the Ground really played a major role in bringing out into the mainstream. Um, so with Common Ground, the goal is much bigger. The goal is in the United States, because this is really, we filmed it during COVID, so we focused on the United States. That was what we had access to during that time. And the goal with the film is to put 100 million acres in North America into regeneration. Wow. And then I'll let you share a little bit about what the goal is with the next film. Yeah, so there, we're actually working on two films, believe it or not, two new films. One of them is called Be the Change. It's a film about restoring pollination, restoring pollinators and biodiversity. Wow. And I believe our co-producer, Ava Kraus, might actually be in the audience there somewhere. Ava! So, Ava, if you Can you wave a hand? Is he here? Wave a hand. Well, I think he went to have and a drink. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that film is a beautiful story that tells, it's, it's really the crux of pesticides and pollination. And then our big next film that we're beginning to work on is Groundswell. And that's the international story of regeneration. Rebecca likes to say it's the story of how we won. <laughs> Can you? I, that's actually what I, what I say. What I say <laughs> is it's the story of how we woke up and saved ourselves. But I like it's a story right. about how you woke up and win the story. Is that is that it? it uh, it's a story. It's the global story of regeneration. So we're going to all the continents and seeing the leaders who are actually on the ground regenerating the earth. Um, and it's the story of how we woke up and saved ourselves. But I kind of like yours better. <laughs> the story of how we won. That's good, because you were talking about fighting the fight and fighting the mental fight, and it's like the story of how we... I mean, both. Yeah. We'll, we'll workshop this Yeah, we'll work on it. You guys can watch our creative session as we do it right here live with you. But um, 
I think we, we don't necessarily want to put everything in a, into a conflict context, but the fight against climate change, uh, Ryland, we, we were working on this little sizzle about Groundswell together with Demi Moore, who is one of the producers, narrators on the new film, and, and she came up with this idea, or maybe it was you or Rylan, or maybe both, that to fix the bigger climate, we have to fix our inner climate. And so if we begin to take some of this stuff out of a conflict context and more into the context of where do we need to heal and reconnect, and where we're seeing that on a massive scale globally, is that regenerative agriculture? Or is it something bigger? Mm, well. When you regenerate a desert, you're co-creating with nature. Mm. You're not just providing a food source for human beings. Yeah. So everything is in everything, right? So <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, okay. We could go on, but... Yeah, no, but I, I would love to go in that route too, but I would like to go back to our European friends here to also frame a little bit this conversation in the very context of Europe, where in 2027 there's going to be a new, sorry, I do not know the name, PAC, but everybody knows here what PAC is. How do you say? CAP. CAP, yeah. Um, Common Agriculture Policy. Exactly. And European Farm Bill. Here we have seen in Europe that uh, in some ways we have been we are totally working counterintuitively um, uh, to what you are defending. So how do you expect to influence this new CAP PAC uh, coming? And what is it that you would need to, to lobby or to be stronger? May I? Thank you. Um, thanks to uh, leadership of climate farmers, uh, the end of last year, more than uh, 70 founding farmers, we came together. Um, almost balanced women and men, which is almost unheard of in agriculture from completely different contexts, small like us, large like some we've seen in the film, um, uh, livestock, agriculture combined. Uh, we came together with the distinct purpose of making sure that our voices, our regenerative farmers, was heard in Europe and most specifically in Brussels. And we're very excited because on the 18th of April, we will be launching our vision for a new common agriculture policy based on regenerative agriculture. Um, I've been in European politics around agriculture for uh, 20 or so years, um, and I was part of the last major um, reform. So it's really exciting that now, um, with such extremes in um, the agri-food industry in Europe, but as we see politically, globally, you know, there's a very much, you know, this, this extreme from left and right, and here in, in Europe, and especially in Brussels, we have this very entrenched um, conventional agriculture system, very similar to the one that was outlined um, in the US uh, in the film, um, but we also have this very strong um, uh, environmental movement who rightly believes that the common agriculture policy is the root of all evil. Um, it started <laughs> as Roosevelt intended at the end of World War II to make sure we will never be hungry again, um, but it has perverted and distorted over the past hmm, seven, eight decades. Um, so, not seven, eight decades, but a long time. Anyway. Um, so what we're seeing is that the environmentalists want to completely dismantle the cap. Um, we're seeing the um, uh, entrenched agricultural, chemical agriculture lobby wanting to keep it as it is. So we are coming with this very strong science-based, outcome-based uh, policy proposal to create this new paradigm, which we're talking about, that will lead to uh, regenerating soils, regenerating communities, and, and completely shifting um, our agri-food system in, in Europe, and hopefully influencing globally as well. Philip, you want to add uh, something on that? No, I think it's a very good start. I mean, essentially, I think we, it's good to point out the people that are currently blocking the progress. But I think we also need to continue telling the, the stories of hope, right? 
We need to continue telling the stories of farmers which are successfully managing to transition, and we need to show that the transition towards regenerative agriculture is the way for food security for Europe, not just on an economical way, but also on an ecological way. And I think the good thing is we're starting to see more and more of these cases, and we're starting to collect more and more of these cases, and I think that movement forward is a movement that will hopefully end in payment for ecosystem services in the next common agricultural policy. And that is the goal that we need to be collaborating across the board with many different organizations in order to make that happen. And if I can just add quickly, I wanted to, to thank Josh and, and Rebecca because um, although my sister who lives in San Francisco now has visited us at the ranch several times since the beginning, she never quite got it until the uh, premiere in the Presidio three weeks ago. Um, and where she finally said, okay, I get what my sister is doing. Um, so uh, if you can get to her, you guys can get to anybody. So thank <laughs> This is what I was going to um, try to ask, maybe Raylan, because now we are listening to you, I guess. Do you hear us well? Yes. Um, so from what I've uh, heard from you and what I am experiencing myself, uh, cultural change comes before political change. You mentioned to me before in the, in the, in the preparation of this um, discussion that for you, to, for you to expect lobbying in the European Commission, you first have to have uh, changed the mindset of the population, hence of or some of the populations, hence of the politician. Um, for you who are um, really crafting films for political change or cultural change, what are the ingredients for a story that instill change? What is it that we have absolutely to have in our films so the mindset are shifting? Maybe Rylan, if, because we do not have heard you. Uh, I'm afraid we do not hear you. No, I'm sorry. Uh. Um, you know, I know one thing that Ryland would definitely share about is restoring people's love of nature and their connection to nature and to each other and infusing this sense of that we're all connected to something that is so much bigger than any one of us. Um, Ryland has really been a champion for making sure that our films have a, almost like a, like a transcendental, transcendental experience, like having someone watch the film and then through the process of that, like reconnecting with a part of themselves, you know, like igniting this deeper intuition, this deeper innate wisdom that we're all connected to. And Ryland has, from day one, made sure that we've been on that sort of spiritual journey together as we tell this story because this is a, a sacred story of of soil which is the source of us all and bringing that deep reverence and honor into the story has been something that Ryland has always been but to have the, the, of that. but to have the opportunity to do that you first have to beat the media landscape that would not necessarily favor this kind of of narration and of of um, of film so how did you how, how do you protect your freedom? How do you protect your ability to tell the story you want to tell them? Well, that has been a challenge over 20 something years of making films and the 20 something films that we've made together. We run counter to Hollywood. We also run counter to many traditional media institutions. But what's, what's been interesting about this arc is when Kiss the Ground came out during COVID, there was a palpable shift in how people responded to the message. And the DNA of that message was there all along in our other films and our other work. But when people were stuck at home and they were sick and there was this global virus, there was a sense of perhaps Human health has something to do with the soil. Perhaps soil has something to do with climate. Perhaps there are all these things that are connected. And Kiss the Ground marked a turning point in our work with audience perception. We're still going up against some pretty powerful forces in terms of media conglomerates and Hollywood and some 
in some ways we're very much in a moment of inflection in terms of cultural perception around food and environment and climate. And what we propose to be powerful solutions run counter to a lot of the traditional narratives that are being put forward by these large technical conglomerates. I think part of why we have succeeded, and if you saw our daily lives, we don't consider it a success. We're, anytime something may succeed, we just move the goalpost further. Like, the goalpost for common ground is 100 million acres US regenerated. The goalpost for groundswell is a billion acres globally regenerated. Because that's 10% of global agriculture. And we think that'll contribute to a tipping point. So part of, I think, the success of the movement right now and why this is gaining traction is even the techno giants who run some of these big media conglomerates that control much of what we see and hear and even down to the level of podcasts. The traditional solutions for climate, environment, food justice, and health have all failed. So there's a big question now. What is going to step into the space? What is powerful about regeneration, it's not a charismatic movement led by one leader. And so it is literally generated from people and from Earth. And that multi-point open source methodology is going to prove to be the, the thing that really comes forward as the global solution. I'm going to do a uh, next attempt with uh, with Ryland. Uh, are you? Can you talk? Yeah. We. Oui. Hi. Can oh, you hear me? Or no? Wow. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for your patience, and uh, thank you the tech team over there. Um, well, they had have, have many questions uh, on that topic. Maybe there's one topic that you want to pick and go a little bit further. Or I have a question for you, but. Um, do you have any comment on what we have shared um, for the moment? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've appreciated the dialogue that I've heard so far, and I feel like Josh and Rebecca have done an amazing job, and it's amazing to see uh, Philip, Phil, Philip uh, and really grateful for him stepping up and having climate farmers really rally behind common ground in Europe. So just grateful for that. But was there was there a specific question that you wanted me to yeah, uh, well, speak to? Exactly. On on I'm trying to bounce back on on what uh, Joss has just shared about the next wave, about this regenerative agriculture, um, is uh, really more about a regenerative mindset uh, in every field of society. You have started Kiss the Ground as an organization, as an attempt, and then it became a film, and then it became it make it it made a, a greater movement and launched something else. You have embodied this this really fact of um, regenerating yourself through lens and then sharing the results with bigger means. Um, is it something that you are sharing with Josh um, about the way coming, meaning that maybe what we are looking for is a new relationship to the world, a new agency? Yeah, I, I would say beautifully said. <laughs> and I would say that the thing that has kept me going on over a decade is the thing I said maybe in the beginning, which is, why I'm optimistic is because I believe at the center of every human being is the presence of love. And at the center of the pattern of nature is regeneration, healing. And we're awakening to that right relationship with the earth 
with each other and with ourselves. And regenerative agriculture is a beautiful example for us to model after, but it doesn't just represent our relationship with land, it represents our relationship to everything. And so there is a moment in time that Josh was speaking to that there's an inflection point where people aren't interested in the same old story. People are listening back to the podcast, back to the media landscape and the, the corruption and the co-opting of what is the narrative that the world is listening to. People are listening to things that are true and courageous. And farmers doing regenerative agriculture is true and courageous. And it's working. As she said earlier, that shit works. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So, so uh, go ahead, go ahead. So, yeah, I, I would just say the, the cultural landscape is changing. So again and again and, regenerative and again. regenerative agriculture is a pattern that is being seen and mimicked and there's a lot of attraction towards it. And I think we are going to see a huge amount of adoption and momentum over the next three to five to 10 years. Okay, wonderful. The clock is like red lighting <laughs> to me. <laughs> so I'm sorry, but I would like to wrap up uh, with a message of love because this is what we heard the love for a good labor of, uh, f of producing and directing a film, a love for the land, a love for farmers, a love for um, a fa um, uh, the generation to come, and the love for nature, obviously, um, starting with us. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you to you too. Pleasure. It was a challenge uh, to have you all on stage with me as a moderator. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, good luck with the film. Um, good luck with the launch in Europe. Uh, Rylan, you want to say something else? I just wanted to say that the film is going to be internationally available uh, on one of the streaming platforms in September. In and Spanish. so we're excited about that. <laughs> and we're also excited to work with Philip to generate some major screenings across of Europe ah, with I climate know. farmers. So you are the head of the campaign, of the campaign. OK, well, go, go to Philip if you want to organize screenings. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for the great love and work that you have done. It's a beautiful labor of work. Uh, and to you, good luck, and uh, yeah, we're all in, all in this together. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Um, Ciao. Sending left America. Thank you.